hey me, isn't me in the wrong dimension? Yeah, but I'm making a video on light pollution and how it affects the signal to noise ratio of astro images. Oh really? Show me what I'm doing. Look, this is what I've got open in GIMP. This is my image of Orion. This layer here represents light pollution. When I increase the opacity, it's like increasing the light pollution. Pretty cool, right? Kind of. That's honestly a pretty poor model. I'm disappointed in myself, because that's not how light pollution works at all. It's worse than most people think. And this kind of thinking might make people think that light pollution can be good because it helps swamp read noise. In practice, light pollution just sucks. It really does even when factoring in how it swamps read noise. Really? How would you do it? Well, you see, first I would... Yeah? And then I would... Oh, yeah. That is pretty good. By the end of this video, they'll understand why light pollution affects fainter targets so much more than bright targets, and why light pollution really isn't good for anything, even when it does swamp read noise. Welcome, Welcome to, to Deep Sky Detail. Detail. So I started off this video showing that light pollution is more than just making an image bright. Let's go back into GIMP for a second and I'll show you what I mean. When I make the overall image brighter by increasing this opacity slider, we actually can get the detail back pretty easily. Let's just make a new layer from the bright image. Now we just do a quick levels adjustment to bring back the black point down and we're golden. It's like nothing ever happened. If this was really like light pollution, we couldn't be able to recover the detail. So how do we model this in GIMP? Well, before we get into that, we need to understand some things about signal to noise ratio or SNR. This part about SNR is crucial to understanding the rest of the video. It sets up the cool visuals I'll explain later. In the previous video, we did a thought experiment. We pretended that a slingshot was our deep sky object and you had a camera with only one pixel. It perfectly measures photons and we're in space, so no light pollution. The deep sky object sends us 10.562 photons on average per subframe. Let's just say a subframe is 300 seconds, but that's not the important point right now. As is an obvious fact that everyone knows, slingshots cannot count. So sometimes it'll send five photons at us, sometimes 10, and sometimes it's random. But on average, it comes out to 10.562. One way to think about signal to noise ratio in astrophotography is to take, I don't know, 1 million subframes and put things into a histogram. A histogram is just a graph that tells us how often you're getting different values. Let me show you how the histogram fills up. On the first measurement, we measure 10 photons. So we put a little box with a height of 1 where the 10 is. The second measurement, we also get 10. So we stack another box on top of that one. We keep putting and stacking these boxes for each measurement. After 200 or so measurements, our histogram looks something like this. After a bajillion, that's probably a real number, right? It looks like this, a Poisson distribution. Believe it or not, this distribution tells us everything we need to know about the signal to noise ratio of our target for one subframe, assuming there's no light pollution or any other noise. The middle of the distribution is our signal, the spread of the distribution, measured as the standard deviation, also known as sigma, is the noise. Divide the signal, or the middle of the distribution, by the noise, and you get the SNR. Pretty nice. But what happens if we have a brighter target? Let's simulate things with a nice little animation showing how SNR changes as the target gets brighter. See how the noise increases? The width of the distribution gets larger as the target gets brighter. But luckily the signal, the middle part of the distribution, also increases. We can graph the SNR by brightness too. Pretty nice. So how would SNR change then with light pollution? And why are faint areas affected more than light areas? Let's simulate that too. 
But before we get into that, let's take a look at the image from our camera, shall we? Here is image from our one pixel camera. It's so beautiful. Look at that structure. What's that? A one pixel camera doesn't show any detail? Well, huh. I like it anyway. But you're right. What makes the image a good image? Well, I think you could argue that structure makes a good image. Look at the image of Orion. There is structure here. This star right here is discernible as a star because it is bright in the middle and gets less bright as you move away from it. Each pixel should have an average brightness and the pixels should gradually change in brightness as you transition to places with more or less signal. So the light pollution isn't really a matter of making the whole image brighter. Otherwise, we could just make the whole image darker and recover this signal. Light pollution destroys structure. Light pollution destroys the transition between the low and high signal areas, and it does so randomly. Remember how the SNR of our target shoots photons randomly? Well, unfortunately, so does light pollution. In GIMP, let's, let's make another layer. I'll then color it black and add some random noise. Change the layer mode to screen and then reduce the opacity a bit. This is a much better model of light pollution. Now, I could go ahead and show you the simulations for light pollution. But before we do that, some of the more advanced astrophotographers out there might say something like, yeah, well, light pollution isn't all that bad. It lets me overcome the read noise of my camera more quickly so I can take shorter exposures. For those new to astrophotography, there is another type of noise associated with your camera. Every time your camera sensor sends the number of photons it has collected to your camera's processor, it has to convert those photons to electrons. That process isn't perfect. Sometimes it might add an electron. Sometimes it might add two electrons. Sometimes more. It's a bit random too. If your deep sky target signal isn't strong enough to overcome the read noise of your camera, you won't get good SNR. There are different ideas for how much more signal you need than read noise, but for simplicity's sake, let's just say you need 10 times more signal than your camera's average read noise. Well, a lot of light pollution will make sure that you're recording a lot more photons to overcome the read noise on every image, so it's good, right? Not so fast. Light pollution increases the number of photons your camera detects, and that puts a hard limit on your exposure time. In a dark site, you may be able to take 300 second exposures of a target. The faintest areas of that target might send only 30 photons to your sensor over that five minute period. In a light polluted city, you might be limited to only 30 seconds of exposure before your stars and brightest areas start to get overexposed you're only getting three photons from the faint areas on average per subframe. The light pollution makes sure those three photons aren't lost in the read noise, but that doesn't matter in practice. Why? Well, let me explain, but first some more simulations and histograms. So here's the histogram of the signal coming from a faint object, and here's the histogram of the light pollution. How do they combine? Something like this maybe, right? That doesn't look so bad. We still have a strong peak here, I'm sure there is some statistical magic we could use to isolate that peak. Maybe use sigma clipping with a low sigma value. No! 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 Okay, let me ask you a question. Did the deep sky object we're imaging know thousands or millions of years ago when it emitted its light how photons from light pollution would be detected when you're imaging? In other words, is the noise from the DSO correlated with the noise from your city street lamps? It's simulation time. We're going to simulate an alternate universe where the noise between the DSO and city lights are correlated. We'll assume that we can reliably determine the exact number of photons from our DSO and light pollution separately. On average, the DSO emits about 10 photons per subframe. Light pollution emits around 40 Let's start making a histogram of the signal and light pollution noise. Keep track of the blue boxes. They're our newest measurements. Our second measurement of light pollution is around 11 photons. In the middle of our histogram. Our second measurement of light pollution noise is also in the middle of the histogram. Our third measurement, our DSO measurement, is around 7, which is on the left side. We keep measuring. 
See how the blue boxes move together? If this were how the universe worked, our combined signal and light pollution would look like this histogram. We'd be so happy because we wouldn't have to worry about light pollution ever again. We could determine our signal much more reliably and create algorithms that could get great images with very limited data. Unfortunately, this is not how light pollution works. It doesn't care about our DSO signal at all. Let's simulate it again the real way. Under this scenario, when we measure a subframe that has a signal in the middle of the histogram, the light pollution measurement could be on the left side of the histogram. It doesn't care. It is completely random. Instead of the new blue measurement being in sync with each other, they're all over the place. Light pollution destroys SNR. It destroys information because it is random. In other words, for any pixel in any given subframe, we can't be sure how much of the measurement is due to our deep sky object versus light pollution. Our combined distribution doesn't look like this. It looks like this. It actually has more noise than the light pollution distribution itself. It is even more random. And this is why light pollution is so bad. Remember this animation? Let's stop at around 200. Theoretically, our best SNR we could get without any other type of noise is around 14. Well, let's include light pollution in red and the combined distribution in orange. The signal from the DSO is still in yellow and it is pretty bright, all things considered. Let's simulate things as light pollution increases. Okay, we'll make a graph of this simulation. This dotted line here will be the theoretical best SNR we can achieve. The x-axis will be the light pollution and the y-axis will be our signal to noise ratio. As light pollution increases, the SNR decreases. That makes sense. But now let's repeat that simulation with a target with a fainter signal, maybe around 10 photons per subframe. Our theoretical best SNR is around three. Now let's add the light pollution and combine things. Look how closely the light pollution and combined histograms are to each other. There is so much overlap here, meaning there is very little transition between light pollution and the target. We're losing SNR quite fast. Let's plot it in the same way. Here's the theoretical best SNR and how the SNR changes as light pollution increases. Horrible. The curve is more steep. But there's a different way to think about this, which is to show the relative percent SNR that we lose due to light pollution. For the brighter area, we lose around 45 to 50% of our SNR at the highest light pollution. That's pretty bad. But for the fainter target, we lose a whopping 85% of our SNR. And that SNR wasn't great to begin with. It's the randomness of the light pollution that makes things so bad. So going back to our question about light pollution and read noise, technically light pollution does help boost faint signal to overcome read noise, but it comes with a trade-off that just isn't worth it. The faint area signal that would most benefit from the boost is also disproportionately decimated by that same light pollution. I've actually got a couple of videos that test these ideas in real life. Here's one that tests a Bortle 7 or 8 compared to a Bortle 3 or 4. I calculated the SNR just like I showed here, but with real data. The results are pretty crazy, and you can see whether those results match the simulations. Thanks for watching and subscribe if you haven't done so already.